Radio. Hey, welcome. It's another episode of Svelte Radio. Hello, everyone. Hi, Brittany. Hi, Jeff. How are you guys doing? So we're missing Anthony and Sean today. Anthony couldn't be here. Sean couldn't be here. I don't know why. Probably busy or sleeping. Who knows? But we are joined by Jeff. Hi. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. We we just started getting a lot of rain where I am, so I've been staying oh. inside. Yeah, you. So you good live podcast on the weather. You live on the west coast, right? See, yeah, West Alaska Washington or? State, Washington. Okay. Oh, okay, Washington. I worked for Alaska Airlines, but they're All right. also headquartered yeah. in Washington. So the yeah. person I work closely with also lives in. Well, actually, he lives in Oregon, but he just said the same thing yesterday that it just started raining and it's like it's rainy fun. season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been dumping, but it's good. You know, rain is good. All right. So, Brittany, what have you been up to lately? Just started building components, which I'm really excited about. So finally out of the carousel, I don't know if I mentioned any of that on air, but we were talking about the carousel the last couple of times we recorded and that finally got shipped this week and I'm done with that. And on to actually building the design system that we're going to do. So I'm very excited to be building components again and not in the app building with that crazy carousel. Yeah, now that makes sense. Yeah, you said carousel, and I'm just like, oh, yeah. (laughs) Those are tricky. No, thank you. Better you than me. I just try to avoid them. Whenever someone wants the carousel, I'm like, ah, no, maybe maybe there's some other way we can do this. Are you sure? Are you really sure you want us to spend 600 developer hours on this? (laughs) Or or whatever it takes. Right after this, like we did a rollout meeting yesterday, and our designer showed on mobile a drop down with a carousel inside of it. <laughs> I was like, am I implementing this? Can we not do that? Yeah, that doesn't doesn't sound like a good idea. But uh. yeah. <laughs> All right. So, like I said, we we we're joined by Jeff. You are known in the Svelte community for talking a lot about the view transitions API lately, right? So, maybe maybe you can give us a, a background on who you are you've been on the podcast before but it's always nice yeah to get true a ref- true refreshing. svelte radio fans and svelte summit watchers but no so yeah my name's jeff i'm one of the current svelte maintainers and like kev said i've been playing a lot with view transitions so i think i i did my first article about them about a year ago the, them being a new and upcoming browser api and i just really want to play around with it in svelte kit so I've been using them a lot. Those Whenever I tweet about view transitions, it does very well <laughs> on Twitter because people just love seeing them in action. Yeah, it's it's too bad. This is a an audio kind of thing where you, you yeah, can't really uh, hopefully show can the concept. how cool it is. <laughs> yeah. But we'll, we'll definitely be able to point to some resources to see them in action because, yeah, it's a very visual API. Yeah. Cool. So Wait, aren't, aren't we like recording screens now and showing video? We, like can't, We, we can't are. Show? <laughs> but, but like most of the people are realistically going to watch uh, or sorry, yeah, listen true. to this, right? It is still a podcast. <laughs> it is a podcast. Yeah. Good audio content. Yeah. <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> yeah. So, so let's get into it. What are view transitions? Yeah. So I, I guess it's important to start out by saying, so we're going to be talking about the view transitions API. And this is a browser API. It's nothing felt specific. So most of what we're going to be talking about today is the browser API, and then also how you can use it in Svelte and Svelte Kit. But this is a transferable, you know, you can use this in Vue or React or without a framework at all. It's uh, it's going to be just JavaScript and CSS. But so yeah, the Vue Transitions API is it's a newer API right now, only implemented in Chrome-based browsers, but other browsers have expressed interest. And it essentially simplifies the process of transitioning between two page states, which you could do before, but it was kind of tricky. So if you imagine... I don't know if you've looked at page transition tutorials in Svelte Kit before. It's like, when I navigate, I want to fade out the old page and fade in the new page. And you can kind of get this with like Svelte transitions or CSS transitions, but you have to position the the old and new pages on top of each other to make sure it's like a smooth fade out. Yeah, that's that's. I think that's that's one of the a common pitfall. I think a lot of people end up in like they 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 forget that. They have to position the the page, like the the actual page component, 
inside of the same element and like do a position absolute or I guess you could also do like grid one slash one or whatever it's called to do that. Too. Yeah, because it's not very intuitive because like you're essentially spelled as holding the old and new pages on the page at the same time and you're having to kind of hack around it to yeah. force them. And this gets also trickier, like if you're like a shared element on the page, like let's say you have an avatar that you want to transition to its spot on the new page, that starts to get tricky, especially if they're separate elements. So what the view transitions API aims to do is simplify a lot of this, give you a way to tell the browser like, hey, I'm about to do a transition, capture this old page state, and then smoothly transition it to the new page state. And by doing that, you just get to remove a lot of code doing this yourself or code from a dependency to help coordinate all this, just the browser is figuring out how to transition between these two states. So this is obviously, it's, it sounds more powerful than just CSS animations or CSS transitions. But I also, I, I guess they're, they're not really aiming to do the same thing, right? You would use animations for something else, transitions for, well, CSS transitions, I guess you They'd be yeah, there, close. There, there's a lot of overlap. And I think one of the cool things about this API is how much it does use CSS. Mm-hmm. Like I believe when they were first working on it, like there was a different way to customize the animations. And eventually they were like, no, to customize these view transitions, you just write regular CSS animations. Yeah. So there's overlap. But yeah, I would say like CSS transitions still have their place, like on individual elements. This is especially page transitions are really good for view transitions because of those coordination problems I talked with. And then also just anything. If you're familiar with the term flip animation, or like you're moving an element from one place to another, view transitions also fit really well with that. You don't have to, because that would be hard to write as a pure CSS animation. If you're doing something more complicated, view transitions, you can just, here's the element, it moved from here to here, and the browser can figure out how to move it to the new spot. Probably way more efficient as well. Yeah, because you're not having to write, it's, it's implemented in the browser. So the browser is able to use its, its lower level code to make this happen. It's kind of amazing how, how we're, we're moving more and more away from using JavaScript for these things <laughs> that we've forever really used, forever really written to, to, to do these app-like things, mm-hmm. right? So view transitions allow you to basically write apps that look more native, right? Yeah, like you can recreate some of those like native going to a new screen, like having things move over and out, like those more app-like animations can be possible with view transitions. And then I guess the other thing, like I think if you've been plugged into the web dev community, you've noticed Astro recently released some support for page transitions. I was getting a lot of hype too. And I think the bringing this this page animation stuff to MPAs that don't use JavaScript for client-side navigation is also a huge win, like unlocking these kind of animations, regardless of what what kind of tech stack you're on. Yeah. So how how does it work on a more technical level when when you implement this? Do you you need support for JavaScript? Or can you do this without? So right now you need JavaScript. The only shipped version of this API is the, basically you call document.startViewTransition to like trigger the transition in JavaScript. So you do need JavaScript to use this right now. They are working on a spec, like what does this look like if you're doing a full page reload? I believe something involving meta tags. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But yeah, essentially what it looks like, how you use this is when you want to start a transition, you call document.startViewTransition and you pass it a callback. And inside that callback, you actually update the page. So if you're in vanilla JavaScript, like maybe you add an element here, remove an element here, change these properties all inside the callback. And then when the callback returns, the browser will be like, okay, we started in this state, we're now in this state, and I will just perform the animation between the two states. It doesn't sound... And how it actually works is really cool. Behind the scenes, it's actually taking, like, essentially a snapshot of the old state and the new state, and then it's able to use that to animate between them. And that kind of solves the problem we were talking about earlier, where it's like, you don't, you kind of have to hack around to have both page states on, around, and... Uh, able to mess with it at the same time. This the browser, like you have two layers of the old and the new states, and that's how you're able to animate between them. It really it sounds like a cool API. I haven't played around with it a lot. It's really cool. It's 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 fun. It's also you know very easy to abuse. I think we're we're probably going to enter an era of people just doing these ridiculous time wasting <laughs> animations, just ignoring. But they look really reduced, cool. Yeah, just ignoring reduced motion. 
prefer yeah prefer, reduced motion yeah. But, but even beyond that just like <laughs> yeah wouldn't it be cool if this animation took like you know 600 milliseconds to like go to the new page and <laughs> got to move all these elements in so I, I think there's definitely an experimentation phase happening right now to try to figure out what a good view transition is but it's very fun it's very flashy to show off when you when you play around with it how would different routers and then different rendering affect this can you do this from a server side rendered route. Yeah, I mean, I guess are you asking like more in general or like SvelteKit specifically? I guess SvelteKit specifically, but even if you were running just a node server, I guess. Yeah, so right now essentially all you need, remember you call start view transition. Yeah. I need some way of actually updating the page inside that callback or at least some way of waiting for the page to update. So SvelteKit we can get into this in a bit, but SvelteKit has a new lifecycle hook. That lets you say, like, you can start the view transition in there and then await the navigation to complete. That updates the page and then it completes. So you can start with a server rendered page as long as you have some way of updating the page client side and and passing that function into the view transition. Okay. And And you to hang on to the state with something. Yeah. And you can can do this, like, I recommend if if you haven't heard about this before, I had a Svelte Summit talk on this. You can do this in regular Svelte. So in Svelte, I, I built a card demo where I was moving cards between the, the two, two different rows. And whenever I clicked a button to move a card to a new row, that click handler would call start view transition. Inside the callback, it would update the state, row two dot append card. And then it would call await tick, which is Svelte's lifecycle method to say like, hey, wait for the DOM to be updated. And that would trigger the view transition because you have a way to start it before the page is changed, make the change, wait for it to complete. And then the view transition ends and the browser would swap the card from one row to the other. That was a really nice talk, by the way. I liked it. It's very visual, right? Unlike this podcast. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely like moving my hands all around, like showing where things are positioned. And it's like, right, you know, audio medium. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> it's tough. So when would you not use view transitions? Yeah, so this is again, you know, plug for my talk where I kind of compared between because if you're if you're you've gotten this far into the podcast, you're like, wait, we already have Svelte transitions. Like, how do those compare? Should I use view transitions for everything? What's the deal? So I'd say like view transitions, as I mentioned, make a lot of sense for page transitions, just because those are kind of tricky to do with our current tools. And then you can also use them for those more flip animations if you're moving elements around a page. Like in my demo, I was moving a card from one row to the other. You can use view transitions for that too. I think they're just like trade-offs because you're just going to be writing these things slightly differently. So for example, with view transitions, you have to wrap each state update and start view transition. If you're using a Svelte transition, it's just like you apply it to the element specifically, yeah. animate flip, Much and then more that will just apply anytime it moves around. Well, that makes sense. View transitions are easier to customize with CSS media queries because you're writing your view transition customizations in CSS. It's really oh, easy that's to a, just that's like... A good point. Different screen sizes, reduced motion, that kind of thing. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. I because maybe I haven't written complicated enough Svelte transitions to actually run into something like this. But you could conceivably imagine that you would need to fly something in from the left if the if the if it's on a mobile screen, and then from the top if it's on on a desktop or whatever. Right. I, I think I've also seen some animation best practices. If you have a really big screen, like it can, <laughs> if you're moving an element across that really big screen, that can be really disorienting. Yeah. So maybe you you do most of your view transitions on a mobile device when things are going to be moving a lot less. Yeah. And then of course the headline media query I think would be like reduced motion is right. a lot easier yeah, yeah. to check with this as a media query. Yeah. Right. So are there other things that we should talk about with, when it comes to view transitions in general? I think one thing that I, I definitely run into as I've played with them. So I guess let's take a step back. With view transitions, you apply a view transition name if you want that flip animation. So like I said, let's say you have an avatar on one page. In CSS, you apply a view transition name avatar. And then when you start that view transition, the browser will see, oh, is there something on this new page with view transition name avatar and know to like animate that between the two positions. Where that gets tricky is like, let's say my card example, where I have a bunch of cards, they're all doing very similar animations. However, view transition names need to be unique. So each, you can't just say view transition name card. 
Because then yep. the browser is like, okay, I'm in this new state. There's 10 things with the name card. I don't know what to move where. So that's where you have to start giving them unique names, which I have an article about how to do this. Like, it's not too bad. Uh, where you run into issues if you want to customize. I want to customize the animation for all the cards, but there's like 52 different unique names for each right. of those cards. I have to target all of those in CSS. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. You have to do it in CSS. You can't do it in with cell IDs and in each loop or something nice. I mean, you essentially can't. Like in one of my articles, I've passed that ID through like a CSS variable and then use that to form yeah. a new transition oh, right. name. But the issue there is then you have this dynamic name. And if I want to say, actually, all these animations should take half a second, I have to target all of those view transition pseudo elements essentially individually. Yeah. Um, so this is another thing where like, okay, maybe it makes more sense to use like Svelte transitions or there's trickier things you can do to like apply the view transition name just in time. So only one thing has that name. Yeah. But this is where view transitions have their downsides. There's proposals to like iterate on this, but it's definitely not something you use for every kind of animation in your app. Yeah. yeah. One thing to, to note as well is probably that we can use view transitions today. Yes. Because they're progressively enhanced. Well, it is a progressive enhancement is probably how you would say it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a big thing because I feel like every time I post about these, people are like, oh yeah, but it's only Chrome. So like, call me in two years. <laughs> and yeah, but that doesn't matter because the, the page is still going to work just fine with you can get it. In the other yeah, and support. I think it depends on what you're using them for too. Yeah. Like, I think definitely like a page animation transition, like that's newer. Like, yeah, not everyone needs that. There are animations that like, actually, I would like to show this to everyone. So in right. that case, maybe view transitions aren't a good fit. Yeah. I wish everything was progressively enhanced. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want access to so many CSS features that I can't use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. At least, at least CSS has been... Like, oh, it's so much. It's been better. getting a lot better. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> well, and you'll blink, and you'll be like, two years passes like that, and it's like, oh right, I can use this now. Yeah, like, I don't know. Sometimes I still get blindsided by like container queries. I mean, container queries. Yeah, you can use these today. Are one of the things that's like, it's just not quite there for full support. So yeah, yeah. but like, yeah, just wait a little bit longer, I guess. Yeah. But it is yeah. very that's tantalizing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, view transitions in a. SvelteKit context, what do you have to do? I think you mentioned it briefly earlier, but maybe yeah, we can I, go over it again. I covered it at a high level, but yeah, I guess, so there's a new lifecycle method. Maybe in a bit we can talk about why we needed a new lifecycle method. It's called onNavigate. It's going to fire essentially just before the navigation completes. So today we have before navigate, which fires before the navigation even starts. We have after navigate to fire after it's done. OnNavigate will fire after all the data loading for the page has happened but before the, uh, the new page is actually swapped into the DOM. So this, for reasons we can get into, is a great place to put your start view transition callback. So inside there, you can do document.start view transition. This is where it gets a little tricky to mouth code because you kind of have to return a promise right. yeah. that resolves and call that inside your view transition callback and then wait for the navigation to complete. Go check out my post on the Svelte blog to see exactly what the yeah, snippet is. Yeah, that's, that's hard to describe in, in words. It, it, it is. <laughs> but essentially, you copy-paste this into your root layout so it plays on every navigation, and then you'll get a view transition on every navigation, and you can customize it however yeah. you want to. I think I saw a library by, I think it was Paolo. Yes. He, he did a library called, what's, what was it called? SvelteKit View Transition or something. I haven't that, checked it something out Something like that. Yeah. I, yeah, I that's, think a, it's that's a good to, call out. I think it's supposed to make this a bit simpler. But yeah, I like I said. Yeah, because I, I, I guess, you know, we've intentionally not abstracted this further right away. We just don't want, it's harder to remove API than to add it, right? So we didn't want to like rush into, this is how you interact with view transitions, kind of leaning on the community to figure out like how they want to abstract it. And yeah, Paolo's yep. library is a great place to start as a lot of helpers for both for like adding this snippet I just tried to talk about. Yep. <laughs> but also like, as I made more complicated view transition demos, there's things you have to do, like adding view transition names at certain times, adding classes to the root of the DOM so that you can, for instance, show a different animation when you're navigating back. And his library just gives you all these hooks to do what you need to do that you would have to like implement yourself without this library. So definitely worth looking into if you're going to be doing stuff with view transitions. Yeah. 
So we'll, we'll put that in, in, in the show notes, of course. So, yeah, I, I mean, that's all you have to do in Kit, I guess, to, to actually get it working. Yeah, just one snippet. And then, you know, like you said, no abstraction. Then the API you need to learn is the View Transitions API. I feel like I bring this up every time I talk about this, but Jake Archibald's explainer on the Chrome developers, we can add that link to the show notes, but that is very thorough link at everything you can do with view transitions. And because like we're SvelteKit is not wrapping this in any way, you have raw access to the view transition. You can do whatever you need to do. So any of those techniques, like you should be able to figure out how you want to tackle them. Kind of like a like the it's it's a very you get the building blocks. Kind of like with uh, with this new uh, Svelte Five thing that that they released, the runes, also yeah, I'm, the I'm building sure. blocks, right? <laughs> yeah. Or I, I guess I, I would uh, maybe a closer analogy is like SvelteKit forms. We mm-hmm. provide some helpers on top of that, but it's like you're using forms. How do you submit this data? You put that it in the input, hidden inputs. You can attach things to the submit button. You're like learning the browser as you work with SvelteKit. Mm-hmm. Now that that that's a way better comparison. Analogy. Yeah, I, I don't really <laughs> want to get sucked into a room's uh, discussion. I'm sure you, you need a whole episode about that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I guess one thing I want to touch on, like I mentioned, is like why this was only really possible because we had a new SvelteKit lifecycle method. And it gets a little bit into the weeds, but personally, I've like been doing these experiments since before that method landed. And there were some limitations. I think the biggest one is that when you only had before and after navigate, you could kick off the view transition and before navigate. But one thing I didn't mention about view transitions is when you start it, it freezes the page essentially. Because like all of a oh. sudden your page is like a static view. Right. And that's why the recommendation is like finish the view transition as quickly as possible. Yeah. Well, if you kick it off and before navigate and data loading still needs to happen Ooh. and your API is like taking a second or two, like you're essentially leaving the user with a, a non-responsive page for a couple seconds. Right. So with on navigate because it fires right after data loading has finished, we can resolve the view transition as quickly as possible and essentially fire it just in time. Oh, that, that's that's good. And then the other thing is I ran into tons of race conditions because the view transitions API is uh, asynchronous and before and after navigate need to run synchronously. Like you're just running some code. So even kicking it off and before navigate without the data loading issue Sometimes it wouldn't start soon enough and Svelte would have already transitioned the page. I ran into some weird <laughs> stuff with preloading. So with Get, this new snippet, hairy. we're actually able to tell SvelteKit, hey, wait, wait to finish the navigation. We're starting a view transition, <laughs> which just, I haven't run into any race conditions yeah. after that. So it's just a lot more stable uh, foundation to, to integrate on. Yeah, so, so this new lifecycle method on Navigate, can it be used for anything else? Or is it just for... Theoretically... For- Um, I think it's very much a target like you know it's written on navigate it's not like kick off view transition so very intentionally written as a generic entry point I think there is one other issue linked Mm -hmm. that like it could have been useful for I forget what it was yeah I was like Uh, what else would you want to do on navigation I don't know there there was something it linked I mean yeah send off some events for tracking people But you can do that yeah, anywhere else. Analytics, like, I mean, uh, there's got to be authentication. But, I mean, you would do all of that on the server. Uh, okay. So there's an open issue around access to history state linked in the view transitions issue. I can just post it in the chat. Hmm. Yep. But the user might scroll or interact with form elements while the navigation is in progress. Maybe we need a way to write to state immediately before the navigation is committed. So I don't know what that's about. I haven't reread this issue. But there are theoretically other uses for doing something right before the navigation finishes. Yeah. But the headline feature of this life cycle is, is view transitions. View, view transitions, yeah. So and I, I think I, it's kind of unique. Like I think other frameworks are having to add similar hooks. So it's not just SvelteKit that had to add something directly into this place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like, I think Next needs something similar, for instance. Mm-hmm. And Astro probably has some, some wrapper around their version. Yeah, well, I think Astro had to implement some sort of basic client-side routing to get this in the first place. That makes sense, yeah. Because it's SPA only right now. Eventually, it'll be MPA as well. But Yeah, with the, with the meta tags thing that you mentioned, yeah. That'd be cool to get that for like non-JavaScript pages as well. That'd be really yeah, cool. Yeah, really, 
it'd be really impactful. I know a lot of people are being like, this will finally kill SPAs. And that, that part's yeah. probably overblown. <laughs> but it, it, it is cool when you can enable capabilities for, again, regardless of your tech stack, you're able to, to yeah. use this because it is something a lot of people want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then last, I, I think we all had the question, but I think you already answered it. You can use it in Svelte, regular Svelte as well. You had a talk yeah. about that. So what kind of stuff did you run into in just using it for Svelte? Did you use a router or, or did you just bring in no. some random router? What, what was the... What? Well, because the, the demo I used didn't involve routing. And I think that's the other thing to... I think I've mentioned, but to highlight about this API is you don't need to route. Like it's any page change. So in Svelte, you know, I built a, built a card demo and like, yeah, I was just swapping cards between positions. So I think the one thing I ran into Svelte that wasn't quite as nice is like every state update has to be wrapped and start view transition. Like if you want it to trigger a transition. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because, and, and part of that is because there's not as nice a spot to like Svelte kit has on navigate. Svelte doesn't have a spot where you can say like every time state changes, start a view transition. And I don't know for sure you'd want that. But that that would simplify demos like that. So you can create a little helper and be like, view transition and wrap that around all your event handlers. But that's where it's a little bit more verbose than the Svelte transition version of that demo would have been. Yeah, well, that makes sense. But I, I, you guys are probably familiar with like um, Jay on Twitter who does like all these like code pens. He's yeah. been playing around with the the view transitions API who for is, very similar things where like who is you this want... Jay? And it's J H three Y or might be J H three Y. It might be J-H-3-Y. two Y's or two Y's. Sometimes I'll put it. Okay. I'll put it in the chat. But he's been doing a very similar thing. We're like playing around with the view transitions API, but for these, like you're not navigating anywhere. You're just adding animation to a single page demo. So I think that that's going to be just fun to see people play around with. And it's nice that you don't have to bring in a heavy animation library if you just want to do a vanilla JavaScript thing like this. You can just this, use This tools. is JBear right here. I can't, <laughs> you probably can't, can't see, see that. It's like a, no. <laughs> a holographic JBear. <laughs> well, it's okay. The, the listeners can't see anyway. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other things that you want to mention with your transitions? Or should we move on to the, the scariest section of the show? Yeah. I mean, I guess the, the last... <laughs> I'm actually prepared for the scary section. Oh, <laughs> I, nobody's going to have one today. So No, I'm good. Um, I, I guess to, to, to reiterate, not everyone can view animation. It can trigger some like nausea in people. So if you're building with this API, be very careful. If you're moving things around the screen a lot, look into prefers reduced motion, maybe disable the animation in that case. But as people are fond of saying, reduced motion does not mean no motion. So... In the Svelte Kit announcement blog post, I actually had a little snippet showing, okay, reduced motion is enabled, just do a crossfade between pages because that's not any motion, instead of like the slide we get when reduced motion is, is not asked for. So just want to re- reiterate and yeah, use this responsibly, <laughs> Yeah, especially if you're shipping it to, to production. Demos can go as crazy as you want, but <laughs> make sure you're making a, a good user experience. Yeah. Oh, good user experience doesn't mean just things flying all over the screen. That's I mean, I, I follow them that too. It's like, we can make things fly now? That's so cool. <laughs> Let me make everything fly. Does it mean um, drop downs with carousels inside of them? View <laughs> transition powered carousel. <laughs> oh. Uh, I mean, I say drop down. It was like an accordion, so at least it stayed open. And honestly, it didn't look bad. Like, it looked kind of good and functional, but it's, implementing that would be a nightmare. If only you you could use view transitions for this somehow. <laughs> I wonder if you could. I think I could, could use regular transitions for that because it's not changing a page. <laughs> yeah, but I, I wonder if you could apply the view transitions API to to like components or switchers somehow. But you would have to. Do you need the the like the browser history, or, or is, is this Why like completely separate? Well, I mean, since it's taking a, a screenshot of the, of the page before and after, is there something the browser needs to know that it's on a new page or a new, new view or like how, or is that all done in JavaScript? I'm just confused with, with like how, yeah, you might be how the browser confused. probably, <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like uh, I mean, the browser you, you, needs to track it somehow. <laughs> I mean, just whatever interaction you want to trigger it, you just call start view transition. And right, yeah, the yeah, updates yeah. happen okay. inside yeah. that. 
Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I if, I think you're, if you're a component <laughs> or whatever you want the transition to be on is on the same page and not leaving that page state, you would just use a normal Svelte transition or CSS animation transition, like anything that's built in, because you're not you you don't need that state. But yeah, couldn't the Svelte transitions at some point be remade into view transitions? I've actually thought about that. <laughs> yeah, um, let's hear. But it. I think there's enough. <laughs> I think there's something to do there. I think there's like something you could do with view transitions as an action that would be interesting yep. to like automatically generate those view transition names and stuff yeah. like that. Add it. On I'm not sure transitions library. can be replaced with them. Just add it to Paolo's library. I think it's actually. Yeah. I think he actually has. I think he uses an, action an action called transition. Yeah. So you just put use transition and then header. But yeah, I that think again, strange. like the the tricky another limitation, like you can only have one view transition happening at once, whereas that's ah, not really true right. for spell transitions. But could could you do? I guess you could still do multiple things at the same time, right? Like move yes, but multiple like, things. But I no, I get. If I, I get click it, on yeah. the page, five different buttons. Those all yeah. start move an element, triggering a spell transition. Yeah, that wouldn't work with view transitions. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. I think you know another tool in your toolbox. We're web devs. We like to be like, what can I use this on? Can I use this on everything? <laughs> yes. The, all, the answer is always yes. <laughs> always. Yeah. Trade-offs and right tool for the job. Yeah. Cool. You had something prepared here for this yes. next section. We're, we're moving on to the unpopular opinions section. And Anthony isn't here. He always has a, an unpopular opinion. <laughs> He's always ready. <laughs> 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 I don't have one. I, I almost never have one. I'm, I'm bad at the unpopular. Actually, I might have one today. So, okay. but but let's let's hear it from you first, Jeff. What's what's your opinion? So my unpopular opinion is you shouldn't be writing aria attributes if you aren't testing with a screen reader. Hmm. Mm, interesting. And I think there's probably caveats to that. But what is your recommended screen reader? What uh, what operating Next system year. are you on? Mac at work. So I'd probably start with voiceover. The voiceover. And then what would you use on Windows? Just N Windows NVDA. N N P N N is in Night V D A. <laughs> I guess like that's not that's confusing. Video so, without the I. Yeah, so it's NVIDIA's yes. uh, stock ticket. Yes. Right? NVDA. Okay. But I guess let me give some background on this. So if you don't know, ARIA attributes are used to Expose additional information to screen readers and other assistive technology. Maybe a common one is like ARIA label. If you have a button with an icon in it, that button needs some sort of text associated with it. So if a screen reader comes to it, it knows, oh, this means remove. So one way of exposing that information to the screen reader if that text is not inside the button is adding an ARIA label equals remove. But the reason I think you should be testing with the screen reader if you're writing these attributes is because it's way too easy to either misuse them or make assumptions about how they work and then not test them and be like, oh, this is actually either not doing anything, best case, or worst case, making things worse and confusing. So I, I think, you know, the analogy I draw, like you wouldn't write a bunch of JavaScript code and just ship it. Well, maybe you would. <laughs> you wouldn't you, though? <laughs> but like write interactions on a web page and be like, yeah, I don't need to test that out. It probably works fine. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> similar with like you're writing all these attributes that are only for screen readers and be like, yeah, that's probably fine without verifying that yourself. And once you get good enough, I've tested with screen readers before. I'm pretty sure I know where an ARIA label is valid and what it's going to do. So in that case, yeah, I'll just, I'll just throw this on because I know it works. But if you're starting out, making sure that you know what you're doing. Yeah, don't stick it on everything. Like that, that, yeah, that one of the good. rules is uh, no ARIA is better than bad ARIA. Yep. Don't stick it on if you're not willing to do the work to figure out, is this actually doing what I think it's going to do? And I also find ARIA in general can be confusing. There are confusing documentation out there. And if, even if you go to the W3C and look at like what you're supposed to do for accessibility for some things, it's not always straightforward. And it's not always explicit, like, this is the right thing to do. And so there's not there's a lot of nuance. A, a, a yes and no, like this case and this case. So like, just it's, it's very hard. 
And I bet you're you're especially running in running into a lot of that with building components. Yeah. Like building a design system. It's like, oh, I'm the one who has to make <laughs> an accessible drop down carousel uh, yeah. <laughs> company. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. So, yeah. I, I I have a question about this because I, I haven't really tried this, but I've heard and read that different screen readers do things differently. So how do you actually make sure that they work for all of them? Is that uh, possible? Or do they differ so little that it's just like small things that don't work? There are significant differences. Or, oh, or how where, fun. <laughs> but that, I think that's where I try not to start with, and you should be testing in multiple screen readers. Because yeah. like a lot of times, just getting people to use one really helps. <laughs> it's a burden. That makes sense. I think, you know, it is a good call out and you should recognize Try not to over optimize. You start with voiceover. Oh, I'm going to make this exactly tuned to voiceover's quirks. Right. Might get you into trouble. But yeah, I don't know. You can find a lot of, there, there are some very dedicated accessibility testers who are like, here's all the differences. I tested these screen reader and browser combinations, and here's how these ARIA attributes behave. I it can be a lot tried to vouch to get somebody that was just specifically for accessibility on. My team, I'm the only engineer. I have one designer and I'm the only engineer. And so it's just accessibility is a full-time job, I feel like. Yeah. And you need somebody that can just test and do that kind of stuff. We are using an open source library that has accessibility testing built in. I don't know that I trust them to fully do all of that perfectly, but I at least kind of feel like it's the burden is not fully on me, but I still like make sure that things work correctly to the best of my ability and look them up and make sure things are done correctly according to W3C. But I, I watched a video last night and they're like, we always get it wrong. Is it WC3 or W3C? We always mix up like which one? It's W3C, right? W3C. Okay, I was saying it right. <laughs> now I think the yep. video has made me like say it. <laughs> it's funny. I, don't know. Yeah, I think that's a, I don't know. I think definitely if you, you're able to get the resources to have someone dedicated to testing this yeah. stuff, like especially they're so far down the rabbit hole you can go. So it's a balance. Cause I think also, you know, accessibility is everyone's responsibility, mm -hmm. but like competing priorities and like yeah. you can go really deep and it's hard to know. Like if we built something more accessible, maybe we would get more users because they're actually able to do the things they want to do. Like, who are we, who are we excluding unintentionally? Yeah. Of I think that's absolutely correct. Yeah. But yeah, don't use ARIA attributes if you're not using the screen reader. And like I've said before, like if you know nothing about accessibility, start by running like Axe Dev Tools on your page. That will catch low hanging fruit. Make sure you can tab around and use the page without a mouse and then yeah. learn how to use a screen reader. Like those will just get you so far just getting some sort of baseline accessibility yeah. in there. I, I feel like I feel like for for a lot of pages that are just content based, it's not super tricky to get it working. Yeah. It's mostly for for more interactive SPA style applications. Like that's when it gets really, really hard, I think. But yeah. Yeah, and I think there's definitely types of applications but I'm like, I don't I don't know how I'd make that accessible. I'm sure there's people who've who've done it, but like Right. I'm sure there's there's ways to do it, but it's outside of what I focused on before. Stuff like I don't know if you've used Excaladraw, where you're like drawing flowcharts and stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, Brittany, do you have a an unpopular opinion? No, I don't think so. Okay. Only popular opinions. <laughs> <laughs> I have one. Maybe it's not unpopular, but I'm going to say this: limitations probably good in the sense that you don't want multiple ways of doing the same thing. I think that can result in fractures in, for example, a framework community, not a community, but like an ecosystem. I'm just talking generally. <laughs> oh, we're not if talking you have, about anything specific at all. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm really not though. Like I, I'm really not. So just like if you have six or 10 different ways of doing something, then everyone has to knows, know all of these six to 10 different ways because you can always encounter them. So I feel like that limitations are good. 
maybe that's not a popular limitations though. to doing things inside frameworks. Yeah, it could be, for example, like the uh, view view three is is an example where you can do things in a lot of different ways. I'm not an expert on view, but this is from what I've heard, and it's not weird that they ended up in this place where you can do things in multiple ways, but it's created this kind of split between view two and view three. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I, that's, I feel like it, that's, that's not good in the long run. But then how would you make changes? It's you... a trade-off, right? Oh, of course. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a trade-off. Yeah. But yeah. But yeah, I, I prefer to only have the one blessed way of doing something. You can have the other ways, but only if you have to go through multiple hoops, making it really cumbersome and tiring to do it. That's my that's my unpopular opinion. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think it's it's a balance, right? Because only one way to do things great for learning, great for like consistency. Like you can jump into a project. I know how this works because yeah, this is exactly. How you do things. I, I mean, I, I have a React code base at work, right? Like, mm, how fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't mind React. That's a different, maybe unpopular opinion. Um, but like, at least here. <laughs> They, they are very devoted to backwards compatibility, which has been like great for them because you're you're able to keep upgrading your application and not be like, oh, we have to rewrite all our class code to hooks. But then at the cost of consistency, and you might have one code written one way and one code written another. And especially as people are coming up, if they're only taught to use a certain API and it's like, how does this work? We have a whole app still on classes. Yeah. I think they're they're pretty common. But like if React did a full break to just hooks is the only thing supported, that app would probably still be on classes and they just wouldn't. Yeah. No, because be we also upgrade. still have Angular JS in our purpose. Yeah, so do we. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, this thing is, you know, probably more common. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you can, you can go both ways with it. And I don't think it matters. They're just trade-offs. But I think it is good when a framework has an, uh, an opinion. Like you have to, that's the point of a framework. Their opinion. Guard, guard rails. <laughs> but of course, you know, yeah. any framework gets to a point where it's like, okay, do we change our opinion or do we have two opinions? So. <laughs> React is a framework, not a library. There's my unpopular opinion. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm not even going to put that much, in the much show notes. Back on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe this, should, uh, this segment should just be opinions. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> probably. Opinions. Yeah. Yeah. Give me an opinion. They're not very yeah. unpopular anymore. <laughs> well, Brittany, since you didn't have an opinion, let's do a pick. Do you have Are one? Are there picks? Oh. Did I put you on the spot here? Oh, uh, da, da, da. I don't I know. I think so. So I've been using <laughs> Flowbyte is the open source library that we've been using. And I really like Flowbyte. And, but its underlying thing is Tailwind, which, I mean, people love to love or hate. And... I don't know. It has made the developer experience so much better compared to what we had before. And there's also this thing that I did not know about. And maybe one of you know what it is. You can put a comment in your Svelte markup or wherever in your Svelte component and do at component and then start writing like documentation. And it gives you IntelliSense for that. What parses that and does that? I think that's built into to the Svelte language tools or the the extension. So is that the Svelte extension? I think so. And I just never knew about it because I'm yeah, like, it is incredible. It's on the FAQ entry. It's not super well documented. Maybe, we, maybe we should do a stream about it so more people can learn about it because it, it, yeah. is, it is nice. I, I rarely I use it. it. I have a front end guild that we do for the design system and I showed them this today and they're like, Oh, can we start using that in our code base? I'm like, I actually don't know what parses this because I'm like, that's markdown. Why is there markdown? I'm like, we don't have a markdown thing in spell. Like what is reading this? And then I started thinking <laughs> about it. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. It looks like it's any editors that use the spell language server should be able to interpret it. Yeah. That's so really- VS code, obviously. Okay, so the Svelte language server and the extension is what does it? No the, extension. the extension is what integrates with the language server. 
Okay. So I think there's other editors that have their own extensions that also use the language server. So, so. Cool. it is so cool. Yeah. That's my pick. It's really nice. That's a good that's pick. A, that's a super good pick. I don't know if I can even <laughs> compete. All right. Jeff, go ahead. You mean, okay. My pick is The Wheel of Time Season 2. Oh, um, I just picked that. Like maybe. Maybe it's not out yet. I, the, I think, your, your episode wasn't well, out did yet. I just, no, you picked no, Silent. I've watched the whole thing now. I think I picked it a couple of episodes ago. Season two is Maybe. still airing. Yeah. I think, aren't you talking about Silo? Maybe I was Wheel talking about Silo too, but did did I not pick Wheel of Time? Maybe it was on Coding Cat. I do too many podcasts. Could have been. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> too many podcasts. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But yeah, so my the Wheel of Time season two, Amazon fantasy show. I enjoyed season one, but I think the ending got a little screwed up, especially with COVID stuff and they lost an actor. Yeah. But I've been really enjoying season two. I think just everything stepped up a level. To me, this yeah, is a really a of controversial opinion because I really do not like the show. But oh, I, yeah, I, I, have, I, I have, feel like I remember you talking about it. Yeah. Have you read the books? Yeah. Oh, okay. And how I, can I'm, you I'm like the kind it? of person who's fascinated oh, by how okay. people adapt something. Okay. Yep. Yeah. To me, it's it's all. It, it's probably because I I kind of read the books semi recently, oh, okay. so it's all like everything happens in the wrong order for me. It's it's I don't know. Are the but episodes yeah, it's, still coming out though? I thought the season yeah, was it's, not, it's not done. Oh. Still yeah, it's still anymore. coming out. Yeah, because it's getting good now. It it is definitely getting better. Yeah, we were talking about it though, because you were just talking about the books again. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. No, no, you're right. I know Kev you're right. went off on this rant last time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, it is good. No, I, I true, can get yeah. how it, you know if you're really, I can get how people wouldn't like the adaptation choices. To me, it's just interesting. Like, how do you take a thousand pages, or like more than that, and yeah. like ten books? You know, what works on the page doesn't work on the screen visuals versus text and like yeah essentially how are they remixing it and i think i'm going to be especially interested as they hopefully get to continue because i remember some of the middle books being a little slow and like very interesting yeah. how they're going to the the like, feigned through. slog the slog i think it's called yeah so yeah been been really enjoying that yeah no i've i've been enjoying it as well even though i don't like the the way they've done it uh, but the i'm i'm like so a, i'm a su- super like fantasy fan so i just yeah. have to watch it i had to watch the, the witcher as well even though i didn't like it so yeah i haven't read those books either i haven't i started to read the will of time books and i think i got a couple chapters in i just couldn't get into the books i don't know why yeah they're they're a bit so the way he writes it's it's like it's very descriptive things take a very long time to progress Is it like sometimes. lord of the rings descriptive like, because that... Yeah, except there's 14 books. I love yeah. The Hobbit, but then, like, I got to Lord of the Rings, and I'm like, I, <laughs> it took me a very long time to finish Lord of the Rings. Like, I just couldn't. Yep. It took me a while to read the books. I'm also, like, I can't really binge a series. So I'd, like, read a book, mm-hmm. and then i take a few months off. Yeah. And then read the next one. But I, I do wonder how this... I guess, Brittany, it sounds like you're enjoying it. Because it feels yeah. like there's some, like, world-building stuff where I'm like, I don't know if you'd entirely... If there's stuff you're missing, if, you, if you're yeah. not super familiar with the books. Because the world is huge as well. Landing. And then yeah. they just randomly introduce someone from, I don't know. I'm just going to You just got to be along breath. for the ride. Be like, yeah. it's, <laughs> it's well, like Game of Thrones, I read those books. And so I think I would probably get into it if I just spent the time to get invested. But yeah. And then, you know, you're three books and you're like, well, I have to keep reading. I've already yeah. read <laughs> oh, yeah. 3,000 pages. Only seven yeah. more to go. <laughs> No, but definitely read it. If you get past, I think, maybe like the first half of, of the first book. Okay. That, that, then it I've heard people have better luck up. with the audiobooks sometimes too, because that'll yeah. just like push you through. It me through the Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the <laughs> You'll love it. You're just, you know, there's I, just some boring parts. I think like yeah. I didn't know enough of the characters. So you need to get in, invested in some of the characters in the first part and they have to introduce you to everybody. And that's the part yeah. that's like boring to me. Well, and it right. could be now that you've seen the show, it's like you have some of that investment. Yeah. Yeah. Only they're not the same character. No. I'm, I'm yeah, kidding. it's different. Oh, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's move on. Uh, or rather, let, I'll, I'll, I'll do a pick. <laughs> <laughs> my pick is the Wheel of Time books. <laughs> <laughs> no, my pick is a series called The Winter King. 
It is, I think, based in the UK somewhere, and it features. It's it's like a, a spin on the the Arthur story, kind of. If that makes sense. It's pretty good. I've been enjoying it. Just came out, started started airing a couple of weeks ago. So, what's it on? Oh, that is a good question. I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> probably like, differs. I've never from, heard from, of it. So, yeah, but it, it probably differs from from Sweden and the U.S. So it's so. not like a streaming service. It's not Netflix. It, I think it According is. According to Wikipedia, it's on MGM Plus, which is oh, a there streaming you go. service. I didn't oh, know yeah. existed. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had no they idea. They just it keep existed. popping up. Yeah. Yeah, and they're gonna die out. I think at some point. <laughs> Disney is gonna take them all. <laughs> unpopular right. opinion right there <laughs> all right i think th- i think that's it for the show uh jeff thanks for joining us again yeah it was great to be back awesome talking about the view transitions api because we we chatted about this i think one or two weeks ago and we really had no idea what we were talking about i think or at least i didn't i just i was wildly guessing things <laughs> that i thought <laughs> i remembered but yeah Well, good content either way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so thank you again, and uh, thanks to all the listeners. Before we go, Jeff, where can people find you, of course? Yeah, so the best place to find me is on my website. That's jeffrich.net, G-E-O-F-F-R-I-C-H.net. I I have a link there pointing you to wherever you can find me on social media, so still on Twitter, and also Mastodon are the ones I'm, I'm mainly posting on. Yeah. And I have, if you haven't read my work before, I have a ton of blog posts on Svelte and SvelteKit, a bunch of stuff about view transitions that might be worth a read. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everyone. And uh, we will see, and we will not see you. You will see us <laughs> next week and maybe hear us next week. And uh, bye-bye. Hey, it's Kevin here. If you like the show, please drop a review on your favorite podcast player. It would help out a lot. Thanks.